You are good to go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So <laughs> nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Jessica. Uh, I'm doing a postdoc here in Astros Capillo and I work with Krista Sagas. Um, I arrived in November here in Greece. So hopefully eventually I can go to the physics department. <laughs> Uh, yes, but today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, some work I did before I arrived. Uh, it's a work I did with Sebastian Schuster and Mike Pisser. And it's about warp drives, tractor beams, and the energy conditions, right? So <laughs> let's start. So it's going to be a bit <laughs> outside of the box kind of uh, talk. Uh, so first, what's a warp drive? Uh, <laughs> So normally warp drives are very much a science fiction kind of thing. So you're watching, I don't know, Star Trek or Star Wars and then suddenly they wanna go faster than light and they press the button and then the spaceship goes. Um, and then uh, as many ideas uh, in physics, actually it started in science fiction and then eventually someone uh, transform that into equations and try to see, is it possible to actually make this or is it not? Uh, so the first person to actually address this subject in the scientific field was Miguel Acubierri in 1994. And what he did is the following. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to explain a little bit of the overall type of thing before I go into the details. So the idea is the following. When you are dealing with general relativity, you have Einstein equations. And so basically, on one side, you have the metric, you have curvature. And on the other side, you have the energy momentum tensor, so your matter, basically. Um, so one way to solve the Einstein equations is to say, OK, I have this type of matter. And then you plug into the Einstein equations and then you see what's the metric that comes out of that matter distribution. The other way to do it is actually to do what we call reverse engineering. So you start by saying, I want my metric to be of this type. And then you do, uh, you plug the metric, so you calculate the Ricci tensor and so on. And then you can find out what, what is the matter that you need in order to obtain that type of space type. Um, so what I could be, I did was basically this. So he said, I want my metric to be of this type, uh, which means uh, you're gonna have something that is going to be moving in the Z direction with a certain velocity. Uh, it's not exactly a velocity concept. I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, more about this, but basically with an observer, which is, you know, stop at asymptotic infinity, they will be seeing this thing moving around. Uh, and then this Vs is given by this over here. So it's related to the velocity of this warp bubble. And this F over here is going to give the shape of uh, this thing that you are. <laughs> so the idea is the following. You're going to have what I could be, he thought is the, the uh, something like this. <laughs> I'm going to come back later. So basically the idea is that you might have a flat region space time in the middle where you can put your spaceship. And, and uh, then you're gonna have a distortion of the space time around it uh, in order to make this thing move, right? So here is the expansion parameter of the space time. So basically um, in the front of the warp bubble, the space time is going to be contracting. So it's going to be pulling the spaceship. And on the back part, the space time is going to be expanding. So it's going to be pushing it. So something that is here, uh, all, all the thing is going to be moving into this direction. Uh, yeah, so this is what this metric does. And this sigma over here is related to how thick the, the warp drive walls are going to be. So in the limit that you take this sigma going to infinity, you have uh, infinitely thin wall. So your metric uh, here, uh, so this F also depends, right? For the outside and the inside region. So you do like a, 
uh, a gluing, a matching of two space times over here. So in this limit, that sigma goes to one, this F is one for the inside uh, region and then uh, zero outside. And yes. <laughs> So here you have the, the metric. So it's a 2D representation and this is uh, moving into this direction. But how to make this a uh, bit more general? So the whole thing uh, can, behind- wait, Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Uh, what is uh, uh, R and what is RS in the previous uh, uh, transparent, this one? Ah, okay. So- um, <clears throat> So the RS, wait a second. <laughs> I forgot my own notation over here. Uh, so the R is the warp bubble radius that okay. you are, and the RS is actually uh, the position that you're going to be. Okay. Yeah, so the, R, the RS can vary, but the R is the fixed uh, mm -hmm. radius mm -hmm. over here. And- Okay, thanks. No worries. Okay, so how can we do uh, mathematically describe this whole thing, right? Uh, so the idea is that you start with a three, three plus one ADM metric. So what you do is that you have a space time that you can foliate it into different uh, time slices, no, uh, special slices into different time uh, uh, moments. Uh, and then uh, what you do is that when you have a, this is the general IDM three plus one decomposition, right? Uh, so you have the N over here, which is the shift vector. So basically it's going to be telling the, the distance between the different uh, slices. Here, the gamma is going to be the metric in this three dimensional uh, surface. And the beta is related to how these uh, sheets, they, they move with respect to each other when you go forward in time. So in that sense, that is related to, to a velocity, right? So you have a, a coordinate point, but then this is, uh, you have this movement into this direction. Um, for the general metric, uh, the generic metrics for warp drives that we're going to be adopting, we're gonna be using unit time lapse. So this N equals one, and we're going to be using uh, flat spatial slices. There are different uh, warp drives uh, which don't use any of those, but we are not dealing with them. It can have some extra complications. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're going to be using the notation of notario. Uh, and we're going to be calling this metric over here, the generic material warp drive. So again, the N, the unit that's uh, it's applied, and then you have the, uh, the <laughs> flat spatial slices, and then you have the, the beta becomes the V, which is related to the power velocity of the warp drives. And then we can define uh, what we call an Eulerian observer. So an Eulerian observer is an observer that has a forward velocity, which is orthogonal to each of these time slices. And it's given by this. So we have that this NA here um, defines the Eulerian observers. You can actually calculate uh, the forward acceleration of the, these observers and you see that's zero. So they are geodesic observers. And from now on, uh, it is, suitable to be using uh, the tetrad formalism. So a nice choice for a tetrad for this uh, type of situation is given by this over here. Uh, so later I'm gonna be showing how the, the tetrads are going to be used for. Okay, um, the other thing is we have these time, um, we have the spatial slices and Every time you have a spatial slice, you can define an intrinsic and an extrinsic curvature to it. So the intrinsic curvature is when you are basically inside the space time. The extrinsic curvature is when you take an extra dimension and you look at it from the outside. And you can define the extrinsic curvature in terms of the lead derivative of the, the three-dimensional metric in the direction of the 
uh, orthogonal vector. Okay, so <laughs> let's go again. <laughs> so the lead derivative is going to be telling us how uh, how this metric, so how this three-dimensional metric that this observer is seeing around them, is going to be changed as time passes, basically. Um, and then uh, the HAB is the, the projected tensor, so is the GAB minus UAUB. I'm sorry, I don't know how many people actually do GI over here. <laughs> I should have asked this question before, but you can ask me more about this in case um, you don't know much of the notation. But the idea is that you are uh, you have an observer and they are seeing a certain curvature around them and this can change with time or not. And this is how this, what the extrinsic curvature is going to be telling us. Uh, and then um, we can use the metric for the work drives that we already have. And then we can calculate what is the extrinsic curvature that they measure. And it's given by this over here. So in this uh, round brackets is uh, the, the symmetric. So it's VI uh, comma J plus J. So it's giving in terms of the derivatives of the velocity of the work bubble. Okay. Uh, and then what we can do after is uh, to use Einstein equation. So we can calculate the Ricci and uh, tensor and the Ricci scalar. And then we have uh, the um, energy moments and tensor. So the energy momentum tensor, the components, the zero, zero is rho. The zero I is the energy fluxes that this uh, Eulerian observer is measuring. And the IJ is going to be giving us the, the pressures and the stresses uh, of this matter. And, and then you can relate all of them. Um, I'm not sure, but I think, uh, I think I was told that one of the people that did some of the recent work drive uh, works actually gave a talk for you guys and a uh, guy called Eric Lance. Um, can you confirm or deny? <laughs> Maybe not. Who was? Sorry. Eric Lance? No, I don't think okay. so. Okay. He gave a talk. Uh... Somewhere you said, yeah. They gave maybe he can give a talk for you guys, but I don't know if he did. Was it for you or no? Not for this group, at least. Okay. Not not here. <laughs> no. no. So basically, no. the idea uh, that I was saying is like um, after Miguel Cubier, he, a lot, uh, not many people work with warp drives because. Uh, well, they violate the energy conditions, which I'm going to be saying a bit more for you. Um, but then there was this claims uh, in 2019, 2020, something like this, and Eric Lentz was the first one to claim that you could build warp drives uh, without using any exotic matter. And uh, basically, <laughs> the idea of our paper was, you know, to destroy everybody's dreams and say, like, no, no, you actually do need it. Um, so one thing that Lenz did in his paper, one of the uh, mistakes, was uh, that he actually never solved Einstein equation. So this is a, it's, you know, might be very obvious, but it's a very important step, is to actually relate the metric that you have with the type of matter distribution that you have. So you cannot just solve one side and then blindly solve the other side and never check if they actually match each other. You know, it's an equation. Um, yeah, so this was one of the, the things that happened. But anyway, uh, so we solved Einstein equations. Uh, and then we can see uh, what is the row that you need to have in order to have the, the warp drive metric. And then you can connect it with, again, the extrinsic curvature that we can measure. So the extrinsic curvature, again, is the only non-trivial physics that you have uh, in this type of space-time. And then you can define the average pressure, uh, this P bar, which is given by this. So just, just take the average. And it's, again, given in terms of the extrinsic uh, curvature K. Uh, so all of these calculations, they 
<laughs> they, they have a bit more in the paper, but it'd be too boring for you. Uh, and then you can just basically sum then, and then you have the rho plus p bar is given by this. So we will be using this equation over here uh, to prove that all the warp drives actually have to violate the no energy condition. So what are the energy conditions? Okay, so we have four of them, uh, the, the main ones, but we have some other ones as well, which were already retired. So the no energy condition is basically the strongest one. So you can see here that if um, this is not satisfied, basically none of them are. Um, and what the no energy condition tells us is the following. If you have any, for all, for all, <laughs> another very important thing that people forgot to uh, check in their proofs, that's for all uh, over here, that for all light-like vectors, so you have a no vector K, uh, you need that this has to be satisfied. And then if you take the energy, um, the stress energy tensor, and you put it, you can show that the, this condition can be rewritten in this form. So you have the rho plus P, so rho plus the, the pressure in each of the directions for all the directions has to be greater or equal than zero. Uh, and then we have the weak energy condition, which tells us that for all time-like vector, we have that this has to be greater than zero. Right, so again, we have, uh, we see that the, oops, that the neck, that the neck is inside the weck, and we have that uh, rho has to be greater than zero. So we have to see, all the observers has to be, uh, has to see positive energy density. We have the strong energy condition. They have the for all time-like vectors. Uh, this is, is given by here. Um, so again, we have that the neck is inside the sec, and we have that the row plus the sum of all of the PIs has to be greater than zero. And we have the dominant energy condition, uh, which says that for all future pointing uh, time-like vectors, uh, this has to be satisfied, and it can be rewritten as this. So the, the um, the modulus of the pressures, they have to be smaller than the energy density. And again, the relation between them, and we see that the, the weak in the strong energy conditions, they don't apply any of them, but all of them are connected to, to the no energy condition. And then uh, a horrible, horrible slide, but I'm gonna <laughs> go quickly for you is that the idea is when you are using petrids, you can actually rewrite the no energy conditions in a simpler way for you to uh, make calculations. So the idea is the following. You take uh, two uh, no vectors, which are oppositely oriented. So you have one plus Li, and we have one minus Li over here. And this Li is any uh, special vector. And then we can calculate uh, the no energy condition for each of these Ls. So we have uh, for the plus one is going to be given the plus side and with the other one is going to be given by this. And uh, so we have uh, two things that are greater than zero. So if we sum them, they still gonna have to be greater than zero. So if we sum those two, we obtain this over here. Uh, and then what we can do is to pick uh, this Ls to be uh, orthogonal vectors, and then we can make this triad thing, and then we can uh, rewrite this in terms of this triad, and then we can take the, um, the average over all the members. So I'm going <laughs> all the way just to show you that in the end, so this over here, they, they, it's an orthogonal triad. So we have that the sum of them is just the delta ij. 
And then we can have in the end that the no energy condition using the tetrad formalism, that's all the, the that needs to be taken is that instead of having the rho plus pi is greater or equal to zero, you can rewrite it in terms as rho plus p bar is greater or equal than zero. So we'd be using this as well to prove that the no energy condition is violated. Uh, and then, uh, yes, wait a second. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, the other thing that one of the papers did was to show that uh, the weak energy condition, it was satisfied uh, for one set of observers. But as I have just shown you, you need to show it for all the observers, right? So you have this for all time-like vectors over here. So it doesn't matter if you prove it for one, you're not proving anything. Um, so just to show this, just to illustrate, <laughs> uh, what we can do is that we can take uh, an energy momentum tensor of this form over here. Um, it doesn't represent anything, it's just something that works, just to show uh, that it works. And then what you can do is, okay, we have this row zero, which is positive. We have this gamma, which is greater than one. So no problem with this energy momentum tensor, we can use it. Uh, and then we can calculate uh, for this set of observers, oops, for this set of observers over here, we can calculate what is the energy density that, that they are measuring, right? So if we do this, we just contract the Vs with the Ts, and then we have that this is given by rho zero, which is positive. So yay, okay, they see positive energy density. Uh, is that all good? How we prove that uh, the WEC is satisfied? Well, not really, right? Because if you take another observer now, a V tilde A, that has a certain velocity V with respect to this uh, first observer, you can again calculate uh, what is the energy density that this other observer is going to measure. So you just take the energy momentum tensor and contract, and actually what you have is something like this. But then, okay, so we have that this uh, gamma is greater than one. So as long as we have that this V is greater than one over gamma, which is fine because gamma is greater than one. So V is less than the speed of light. We're going to have that this rho uh, tilde is negative, right? So we see that different observers, one of them can see a positive energy density with this uh, particular uh, type of uh, energy momentum tensor while the other is not seeing it. So this is just to show the importance that if you're going to prove that uh, a certain energy momentum tensor um, does not violate the WEC, you have to show it for all the classes of observers. Okay, but why do we care <laughs> about the energy conditions, right? Uh, first of all, because nature apparently cares about it. So all the matter that uh, we see around us in general, it obeys all the energy conditions. Um, the other thing is that we don't have to specify the equations of state of the matter. So they are important for you to, to calculate singularity theorems, for you to have positive mass theorems, and <laughs> to avoid weird space times. So uh, as I said, they are a sort of etiquette um, the energy conditions are sort of etiquette that matter has to satisfy. Uh, they are not always obeyed, you know, but in general they are. Uh, so how much should we care, right? So sometimes they are violated. So the no energy condition, the, uh, it is violated when you have no, minim no minimally coupled uh, scalar fields. And when you have, for example, the Casimir effect, uh, the weak energy condition is violated for an empty Sitter spacetime. So if you have a negative lambda, uh, spacetime with negative lambda, the strong energy condition is violated uh, when you have inflatons. Uh, so inflaton fields violate the strong energy condition. And the positive lambda set space set that violates the strong energy condition. So Okay, they are not, you know, something that if, some, if a sort of matter violates 
um, the energy conditions, they have to be ruled out or anything like this, no. But they give us, you know, if you have something that violates the energy conditions, it makes you think twice or maybe three or maybe four times like, hmm, is there something here that, that might be wrong, right? Um, and the most important thing that we have to notice is that the violations, that, the example of violations that we have of energy conditions, they are either on very small scales or on cosmological scales, but you don't have any example of uh, violation that are on macroscopic scales, you know, of the size of a spaceship or something like this. <laughs> so uh, we have to take this into account. And oh, the other thing I forgot to say is um, that again, this type, for example, the Casimir effect, uh, you have the, the, the at the normal energy conditions, the neck, wax, blah, blah, blah. But you also have the average ones. So the idea is that you might have uh, violations of the energy conditions uh, locally into small regions, but you can define the A neck, which is the average no energy condition. And then you can uh, show that in the whole uh, overall region, they are still uh, satisfied. Okay. So now let's go to the violation of the neck. So as I said, uh, we'll be using the formula over there that I showed back then. Um, and we have that the neck requires that the row plus the P bar has to be greater than zero for this case uh, of a warp drive, right? Uh, and then what we have is the following. So here we have this um, trace of K square which can be rewritten. So the trace is given by the K uh, ij trace free plus the one third of K delta ij, the trace part and this squared. And then what we can do, so here the, the trace free part of so the trace of the trace free part is zero. And then we have, no, sorry. Yeah, this part, <laughs> wait, forgot what I just said, okay. I have this part over here and we have the other part over here and the cross term is going to be eliminated because it's the, the trace of the trace free part. But the trace of the trace free squared is not necessarily zero. Okay. Uh, and then what we can do is to rewrite this part over here. So we just substitute this over here and then this is what we obtain. Uh, that this has to be less or equal to zero. Uh, and then just rearranging, we have that the lead derivative of this, uh, of the K has to be smaller than this. Uh, however, the lead derivative, remember, as I said, uh, is, can be given as uh, how this thing is going to be changing along the, the direction of this observer, right? So we have that um, in the tetrad formalism, you can just say that this uh, lead derivative of k is just given by dk d tau. Uh, and then just putting this over here, we have the dk d tau has to be smaller or equal to this, which is less than zero. So this is a square term, this of course square thing. So this is uh, either negative or uh, zero. Okay. Next step. So this is what we're going to be using, this formula over here. And then what we have is the following. The tau refers to the proper time along, the, along this uh, Eulerian observer's trajectory. And we have that uh, this equation is going to be telling us how the extrinsic curvature uh, will change for this Eulerian observers, where they are located. Uh, and the other thing that's important to notice is that the, the, the learning of servers, they can, uh, how can I say, populate <laughs> the space time. So they, are, they form like a zero vorticity congruence. So at each point, these observers, uh, you have on, only one of these observers. So you don't have that this congruence crosses each other, right? So at each point you have, one and only one Eulerian observer. Um, the other thing which I didn't mention before is that the fall of conditions for warp drives. 
So you have a warp drive and you want it to be located into a certain region. You don't want it to be infinite. You don't want it to go all the way to spatial infinity, right? So you expect that this extrinsic curvature, you know, like the, the Alcubierre one, that is going to be localized. So you expect this to go to zero at spatial infinity. And finally, uh, so we have an observer which is sufficiently far away from the warp bubble. They are going to be measuring uh, this Kij as close to zero as this follow of conditions uh, are, right? So we don't even have to impose really strong follow of conditions, but they, they exist, it goes to zero. So when the observer is sufficiently far away, this, is, this will be um, as close to zero as possible. Okay, and now the proof. So the idea is the following. We have here the warp drive, right? So here we imagine to be the walls of the warp drive. And here we have a region which might be flat, which might not be flat, depends on the warp drive construction. And then we can have, you know, different type of uh, Eulerian observers passing through this warp, warp drive. You have one that might enter this flat region. And we have one that can be passing, not inside the flat region, but, you know, between the, the walls in the wall region, right? And, okay, so there is this paper, which uh, I terribly forgot who wrote it. <laughs> uh, but they show you, uh, I, can, I can check the name later. It's a really nice paper. Uh, but what they do show is, okay, we have this uh, observer over here, and then we can ask, okay, I'm there, I'm an Eulerian observer, and then the warp drive is passing right uh what happens like am i going to you know be hit by the front wall and never enter am i going to be able to enter am i going to be able to leave you know because you have this um the space time this wall construction what's going to happen to this observer so what they show is that any observer who doesn't enter this flat region will enter will be hit and will carry you know will be moved by the the warp bubble for a while but then their velocity is always going to be smaller than the bubble's velocity so that eventually the warp bubble passes and they keep behind so if they're standing still and the warp bubble comes what happens is like they're going to be slightly moved but then after the warp bubble is going to pass and they still going to be arrested so there's this paper that shows that. I'll check the name later <laughs> if you want. Um, however, if uh, they do enter this flat region, they are carried around with the, with the bubble. They never leave it. So because of that, we are going to pick an observer who which doesn't enter the flat region, but which passes by the work bubble. So we take this observers over here, right? And again, if we prove that the no energy condition is violated for one observer, then it's violated at the end, right? So uh, obviously to try to prove that it's real, to, to prove that it's not violated, no way. <laughs> if we want to prove that it's violated, we only need one. If we want to prove that it's not violated, then we need to prove for all. So we are in the easy case scenario. So we're going to pick this observer over here. And then what's going to happen? If this observer is sufficiently far away in the beginning, what they're going to be seeing is a K in extrinsic curvature that is uh, basically zero when they start, right? And then the warp bubble is approaching them. When this happens and they enter over here, this K will be different from zero because they are inside the warp drive. Right? Because if it was zero before or zero after, then nothing passed. Uh, and then after, they will leave the warp bubble, and eventually this k will go back to be zero again. All good. However, the neck, the no energy condition, requires us that this 
dk d tau has always to be uh, smaller or equal to zero, right? So if it started at zero and then it went to something which is non-zero and it comes back to zero, when it comes back, boom, the end. The low energy condition is violated, right? So we have that this, uh, the violation of the no energy condition is a necessary condition for the space time to, I like this phrase, restore its asymptotics after the, the warp drive passes by. So actually in the beginning, we had a way more complicated proof for this paper. And then we had a really good referee. And then we decided to redo the whole thing. It took us months, but we finally came up with this proof, which I, I don't know, I particularly like, because it's very simple. Uh, okay, <laughs> now all the maths part more complicated is done. We have showed that the no energy condition and therefore all the energy conditions are violated, uh, but we can still have some fun about it, right? So let's see some stuff about warp drives. So here we have <laughs> our uh, little, green alien into the spaceship and they are inside a warp drive, right? So here, this region uh, over here is faster than the speed of light and they're just moving around. So one of the very, very interesting features of stuff moving faster than light is the following. Okay, so if we have this observer, so who is seeing them right now is someone who is initially at rest uh, with this, uh, with this warp drive uh, uh, reference frame. However, what we can do is to again, take a different observer, which now has a certain boost with respect to this observer over here. And then we can see what this observer is actually going to measure, right? Uh, so if we take a boosted observer, oh, now the thing is over there. Uh, if you take a boosted observer, we have that the their T and the X line. So we're going to have uh, this boosted uh, frame over here. And what they're going to be seeing is actually uh, this. So here uh, are the constant time slices. So here they are seeing one uh, little spaceship. And then at some moment, they're actually going to be seeing three of them. So in two of them are basically annihilating each other and the other one uh, going on. So this is just for uh, some amusement. Uh, and again, of course, we can show that, the, that this uh, warp drive is always going to beat light in, into a, if it, it's in a type of race, you know? So we have, initially we have a light, uh, light ray coming out over here. And we have this warp drive observer going. So here they're accelerating. And then, so they start with the light at the same point and then eventually they meet the light rate again. And then we see that they uh, always win, you know, from the, from the light ray. So it actually, it's going faster than light. And <laughs> just to finish, <laughs> we're gonna talk a little bit about tractor beams. So, uh, what are tractor beams? Tractor beams are basically, again, uh, something else that came from science fiction, right? So you have the spaceship and the abduction type of uh, thing, uh, or you can have a spaceship, uh, I don't know which one is that one. Uh, I'm terrible with science fiction, actually, for someone that's actually working with it. Uh, but <laughs> we have the spaceship, which is grabbing another one and pulling it. Uh, so can tractor beams actually exist? So, okay, warp drives, uh, they have already, you know, we have the, the mathematical description of them. They, we don't actually uh, are able to construct them because we need exotic matter, which violates the energy conditions and so on. Um, but what can we do about tractor beams? So are tractor beams really still science fiction? So for some people, uh, not really, but at the same time, kind of yes. 
uh, but we do have uh, already a lot of tractor beams going around, but they're mainly acoustic, right? So initially actually started with the optical tweezers. So you have, um, yeah, optical tweezers, they're, they're very much uh, around. You have several papers talking about it. So how you can uh, have these uh, light beams and then you can adjust so you can actually pick stuff with them. Uh, but the, the new thing, actually not the new anymore, you know, 2008, uh, but they're becoming, uh, there's a lot of progress going on, you know, from the beginning up to now, uh, is to actually construct acoustic tractor beams. So the idea is that you're going to have sound waves that uh, you can modulate them in order to, again, create like a tweezer to pull and pick and move stuff around. So this is a picture of uh, a real one. If I am not, if I'm sure it's this one over here um, that they constructed. So you have all the, this little acoustic uh, thingies and they're producing specific sound waves in order for this ball to stay still or it can move in any direction. Apparently initially the problem is that the ball was always spinning and then they, they had to make some adjustments so you could take out this uh, rotation type of thing. Um, we also have some metal wave tractor beams, uh, which they're making with, uh, I, I believe is purely theoretical at the moment, but they use the, the boogie waves, the waves of the massive particles to construct it. Uh, but okay, but the, <laughs> what about the general relativity? tractor being, you know, the one, the spaceship. Um, so we made the first attempt to build a mathematical definition of uh, a tractor being in general relativity. And actually we built them using, again, this reverse engineering. We said what we want the metric to be, and then we calculate the energy momentum tensor uh, to build this metric. And they are based on the warp drive metric. Uh, and therefore, they present all the same problems that, as the warp drives uh, have. So they do violate all the energy conditions, and they will require exotic matter. However, it doesn't stop us, you know, from checking what we can actually do. Um, I have not seen the time. Oh, okay. Uh, let me come back here. Okay, so what we do is that we start again with the generic uh, Natario warp drive metric, the same as we had before, but now we're going to modify uh, this Vs over here uh, to have a sort of a beam form. So here they're going to be um, symmetric, you know, uh, axially symmetric. And uh, we're going to have this K and this V over here, which is actually going to have the, the, this beam profile. So for uh, the, not, the Alcubierre case, we have this, this uh, case over here, they were zero, and we have that this H's were zero, and we only have this uh, over here, right? Uh, this zero expansion and zero vorticity, I didn't talk much uh, for you, but the idea is that you have zero expansion warp drives and zero vorticity warp drives as well. Uh, but the idea here now is to actually construct uh, something that we can uh, create this beam to be able to, to pull it or push things around. Uh, so just like before, we can calculate the energy density and we can calculate the energy fluxes and all the pressures. And what we can do when we have the pressures is that we can actually obtain what are the forces that these beams can create. Uh, so here we have we have made uh, two possibilities in the paper. We have the narrow beam and we have the wide beam. So for the narrow beam case, um, so the narrow beam is when the the beam is much uh, smaller than the target, right? The wide beam is when the target is smaller than the uh, than the the beam uh, thickness. And then what we have is that the force that is going to be uh, created by this is actually just integrate the 
the ZZ component because this is where we have the, the bin. And if this force is negative, so it's pulling it, so we can call it a tractor beam. If it's positive, we call it a pressor beam, so it's, it can pull stuff around. And we can also have stressors beam. So stressors, is, uh, the idea is when you have um, a force variety along the object that varies so much that you're going to have uh, the thing being pulled apart, right? Uh, so they are a bit more complicated because actually what, what's a stress or not is going to depend on the, on the material, on how, how the material is uh, strong, resistant or not to have uh, distortions in it. Um, and then, okay, so what we can do is to have uh, different type of scenarios for these Fs and Hs and Ks and Vs <laughs> uh, to create different type of profiles of forces that you're going to have. So again, it's the reverse engineering. So we can say what we wanted to do and then we can uh, check if it obeys or not. So here we have a flat cow scenario and uh, we have that this alien is trying to abduct this cow and <laughs> What we do over here is that um, we can have uh, a beam of the type of the Alcubierre that we had before, which is the red uh, curve over here. So we see that it's only going to pull the cow towards them. Uh, we have this other one for the zero expansion uh, type of warp drive. And this is the narrow beams and this is the wide beam scenarios. Um, don't don't need to care too much about that now. The idea is that uh, you just can create different types of uh, force profiles over here. Uh, but this is not my favorite. My favorite is actually this one over here. So when we use a bump function um, to create this thing. So the idea over here, uh, we have uh, the Alcubierre D. So in here is going to give us the energy density. And this uh, purple line over here is actually going to tell us where the, the energy density is zero, right? So we have that on all of them, we're going to have that uh, in parts or in almost everything, we're going to have the violation of the energy condition. We're going to have a negative row. Uh, however, uh, uh, what we can see is that uh, this is going to be pulling the stuff around them. Uh, the the being the put the flat cow over here, so it's going to be pulled over here. But this one, look how cool it is. So actually, what it's going to do is it starts pulling the thing, and then eventually it gets with a zero force. So it's just going to approach the target with constant velocity. And then you have like a sort of a pressure after. So, and this area is the same as this one. So it arrives here with the same um, at rest again. So if it was at rest initially, it would be pull, constant velocity, and then it'd be slowed down into the spaceship, which is really nice. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's basically the idea. Uh, there are still some, open discussions and I don't know there there are uh, many people trying to work on warp drives at the moment I'm not gonna lie if I say you know I think I'm even though I'm working with all of this um, I think I, I see myself as a bit of a closed-minded sort of physicist and I don't see much uh, the point and I don't know and to keep looking so much of these things when you, we already know that they uh, basically you know there there are there are so many new things that you can find into a certain subject and I think it's trying to it's starting to be a bit push we did this type of work because again there are so many people doing this uh, sort of thing and claiming that you could have 
um, warp drives without violating the energy conditions. And it was getting to a level that it was, you know, concerning, like we have to do something about it. Let's show people that no, you, you cannot. Um, but yes, uh, but there are still some things that actually it was, uh, it's still a bit interesting because in the end, uh, what we are doing is always taking a three plus one uh, ADM decomposition. And then we are just working around with the Vs to define uh, what is the, the warp drive. Uh, but uh, what we also have shown, and some people of Bovrick and Martiri, they have made some uh, mistakes you know, with uh, coordinate transformation, uh, claiming that some stuff were warp drives. And actually, they were just a Schwarzschild metric in Pan-Levy-Gustrin coordinate. So you just make a coordinate change. So it's basically Schwarzschild. So the idea is you can write Schwarzschild in the same uh, type of uh, way that you can write a warp drive. So to have this uh, real definition of what is a warp drive, it's still an open question. So you can take all the all the black holes and regular black holes and everything from the, the definition that we have. Because the best definition we have at the moment is the generic material. But apparently it's quite complicated and I don't know, we might do some work more on that in the future, but yeah, that's it. So thank you and we finish here. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Very nice. For this nice talk. No worries. Um, are there any questions from people in the audience? Yes, Tassos. Yes, first of all, I should uh, thank uh, Jessica for accepting the invitation and uh, for the very nice talk. Uh, so I have a, a question regarding uh, the analog models, if uh, you know something about it. For example, what would be the equivalent of the null energy condition for uh, for a mass uh, system uh, in these models? So if you say that uh, people have uh, succeeded in making some sort of a warp uh, analog space times, um, what did they violate there? Ah, you mean in the tractor beams, you mean? Well, yeah, in the tractor beams, you saw some experiments. In that case of... Yeah. But uh, my question also was, uh, well, it's more general whether there could be analog models for the warp uh, space times. Mm. Uh, and uh, but also in the tractor beams, you you said that uh, tractor beams in general violate the null energy condition, isn't it? Yeah, no, they do for the for the general relativity case that we have constructed. Yes. Yeah. For so the here, what yeah. what what do they violate uh, in the analog uh, construction? How do I understand that there is something strange there? In this ones over here, they don't violate anything because they are not, um, they are actually just using sound waves to construct. So it's a completely different type of scenario of this one over here. So they don't, uh, so it's not really, uh, what they're doing is not an analog type of thing that, you know, they take the GR uh, scenario and then they put it into the matter. They actually just uh, did. Uh, they actually did the reverse engineering in the sense that they knew what the what the wave profiles that they wanted to have, but they are just basically using acoustic waves to con to construct it. So it's very different from this. So it's not a it's not an analog case. This one over here. But if they can construct a war drive in an analog, I don't think so. Maybe one thing that could be possible. 
it would be like, I don't know, I'm just thinking right now, right? Uh, <laughs> but if you have, for example, uh, a medium, like uh, an acoustic medium, and then you could technically construct something that has a speed faster than the speed of the sound inside that, that medium. So yeah, that's easy to do. It's yeah, that's easy. But I don't think I don't know. I have never thought about workflows in the in the analog case scenario. Yeah. Because uh, well, the 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 way I understand this analog thing is that you are just uh, producing a, a a background where your sound or your optical beam moves. Uh, and this background uh, it looks like your metric, this yeah. uh, this warped uh, metric. Now people have uh, claimed that they have produced backgrounds that look like black holes, uh, black hole metrics mm -hmm. with horizons. So I was wondering whether uh, you know whether they can they can do something with uh, warp uh, like. Uh, metrics and in that case i i was wondering whether one can see a violation of something <clears throat> i don't know like a, an energy condition uh, at, at least locally i mean a, another uh, another question that i had was that okay you violate the these energy conditions uh, globally i suppose but what about i mean what about cases where you uh, you can allow yourself to violate an energy condition locally but to fix it globally somehow like these are symptotics of the extrinsic character that you saw mm -hmm. uh, that uh, actually i think it's it's a very nice result i didn't know about that that uh, the that the the derivative of uh, of k of the extrinsic curvature trace uh, is uh, monotonic yeah this is uh, this is a nice uh, i think result uh, uh, but um, whether um, well, it's lo it looks like, you know, the entropy thinks, okay, the entropy always increases, but locally you can have situations where the entropy decreases mm -hmm. uh, and also other quantities. So I was wondering whether you could assume that uh, you can violate the null energy condition locally and you can have these warp things locally, but eventually, mm -hmm. asymptotically, of course, you, you cannot. Oh, um, and yeah. all the all the violations are local, indeed. So uh, even in the the case they have for the the warp, the Alcubierre one, which is the first, you have uh, the violation mainly in this region uh, over here, right? Uh, so it is um, all the all the violations are local. But again, uh, of course, you can have like the a neck, as I said, the average no energy condition, and then you can have that the a neck might be satisfied, which is fine. The problem is that uh, for you actually constructing something uh, of this type, you require quite a lot of uh, exotic matter. So you have to be mm -hmm. local, but you wouldn't be, you know macroscopically, you have to be macroscopically local, uh, which at least at the moment, we, we haven't seen any violation of this type mm -hmm. in nature. So as I said, it's not like the, the energy conditions are really strict rules that nature has to obey, but they are, you know, etiquette. <laughs> things and since we have never seen something like this it might be trickier to actually do something the, the, there are proofs uh, from uh, string theory that for the null energy condition uh, for example that it has to be satisfied so but, uh, 
in the that is in the contents of a, in the context of a quantum theory mm -hmm. of gravity but uh, okay this is another subject okay yes thank you thank you jessica okay okay more questions yeah i would like to uh, ask something to jessica if possible yeah sure okay uh, Jessica, I, I saw that you base your analysis using on the use of the extrinsic curvature tensor, mm -hmm. uh, which, if I remember well, uh, it's the the expansion and the shear. Assuming that in your case there's no vertices, yeah, yeah, yeah. would it help if you actually use these two variables instead of the extrinsic curvature to give you a kind of kind of uh, alternative insight or something like that? And also that condition that tells you that the derivative of the extrinsic curvature is always negative. What would it mean if you uh, translate it into expansion and shear physically? Okay, so the shear, let's think about it. <laughs> Don't know. Uh, so, so oh, where was it over here? So the shear will basically be the trace free part over here, right? And the K is the, yeah. the expansion. It's only expansion. Yeah. So in the end, it will be given in terms of the shear basically because the, I don't know, the K is here, wait. So here have the, uh, yeah, so here and we have the, the shear and here we have the, the, the shear. The yeah, K is the expansion, okay. And the expansion, K, right? K is the expansion. And K yeah. trace three is the shear effectively. So with probably some uh, uh, proportionality factor maybe. Yeah. What. Um, so I, I was mm -hmm. wondering whether using these kinematic variables instead of the curvature per se, Mm. might uh, have a different perspective to the to the problem. Possibly. And I was also wondering what this condition that you have here at the end of the page. Uh, so this is effectively the derivative of theta, of uh, the expansion, yes. OK? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which has to be smaller than, yeah. than the trace of the trace three squared. Yeah, and which is that's the, that's kind of difficult to envisage, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, but again, keep in mind that this all these calculations it's made for the for the warp drive metric, right? So for you to obtain this equation over here, you uh -huh. have to start with this metric, uh -huh. right? So so ah, okay, metric, so it's a special case. That's what you mean. By this, so it's not general. It's not only correct. For this. Sorry. This type of scenario, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, if you have to keep this but, in mind and not get to extrapolations. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is not a cosmological type of solution. No. Uh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, this, uh, this, this type Although, of metric. Maybe, uh, have you ever thought of this in a cosmological kind of context, uh, Jessica? Uh, I don't know, it's complicated, right? Because the, the idea is first you need to have a localized sort of thing. If you if you extrapolate all the things. So actually there's a thing called the Krasnikov tubes. I don't know if you've ever heard about it. No. So in the warp drives, you have, uh, you know, you construct this uh, thing, you put the spaceship there and then you move it around. Uh, while the Krasnikov tubes, they are much more similar to wormholes type yeah. of things. So you have something, you know, you can have like a, a, a tube indeed in space time, which is fixed there. And then you just put the stuff in one side and then it goes to the other. So the Krasnikov tubes, you could actually have something, you know, extremely big. But again, for you to construct these things, you need exotic matter. So the larger it is, the more exotic matter you need it. So the more impossible maybe to actually get something around. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Okay. Maybe this... doesn't, I don't think it makes much sense in the cosmological scenario. Well, I 
I should add that uh, this type of metric that you wrote uh, in some cases is called the Zermelo type uh, of metric. Mm. Um, or uh, it's a generalization of the optical metric where V is a velocity mm -hmm. indeed. And uh, you can put in this form many uh, black hole metrics basically. Uh, care uh, yeah. or uh, black holes, etc., Rice and Rostrom metrics, mm -hmm. um, as uh, you know, as vacuum solutions. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very interesting that uh, you you solve the equations for uh, for matter, and it gives you some conditions on the extrinsic curvature of this metric. Yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. Yeah, that's the thing that when you put that the v has to be uh, non-zero so yeah it's so there are this uh these papers that i said the um, one was from eric lenz the other one was from lavinia heisenberg and uh sean fell and the other one was from bob brick and martiri and the one from bob brick and martiri they did a lot of this type of things of you know let's impose uh spherical symmetry and let's impose, they impose a lot of things. And then in the end, they calculated uh, the, uh, the energy conditions and they showed that they were not violated. But basically uh, when they imposed all of those things into this metric, what they actually had in the end was Schwarzschild. So great, mm -hmm. <laughs> Schwarzschild actually obeys <laughs> the energy conditions, you know? Um, so you actually have to be very careful. Uh, so that's something that we actually really wanted to do was to find how to how to how to make you know explicit. Okay, you start with this, and what do you actually really need to make sure that what you have is a warp drive and not uh, a coordinate artifact, you know? Um, but mm. It's it's trickier than it seems. <laughs> Are there more questions? I guess not. So let us uh, thank Jessica again. I'm gonna. Uh, stop the recording and then we can discuss more if you wish. Okay, thank you, Jessica, once again for this nice talk. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, thank yeah, thanks a lot. It was really nice. I don't know who is actually here in Greece and who's not, but <laughs> I have to 